This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today, we're going to talk about some important new revelations in the ongoing mystery around the origins of COVID-19, although maybe it's not such a mystery anymore. Um, Liz Wolf is off this week, by the way, so it'll be just me talking with two people who've done way more than most in advancing our understanding of how the virus that changed everything originated. It's an important question that I've thought at many times we'd never get a satisfactory answer to. But this new information is pretty revealing and remarkable, and I think tips the scales quite far in favor of an explanation involving a lab accident in Wuhan, China. The new information was brought to light by Emily Kopp, a science and health reporter with the nonprofit public health watchdog group U.S. Right to Know, who's been doggedly pursuing and obtaining documents related to this question for years now. Emily, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Emily, I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, also here is Alex Washburn, a mathematical biologist who's applied his training and expertise to study and publish uh, about the evolution and spread of COVID, and who co-authored a paper that we'll talk about that had some of its predictions seemingly validated by some of these new documents Emily recently published. Alex, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for having me here. Sure. Um, I want to start with a discussion of these new documents uh, you obtained uh, on January 8th and published on January 18th, Emily, uh, under the headline, let me pull this up here, uh, U.S. scientists proposed to make viruses with unique features of SARS-CoV-2 in Wuhan. Uh, first off, Emily, just tell us exactly what these new documents are and why you were seeking them in the first place. Sure. So this all started back in 2021 when the independent research group Drastic obtained um, a leaked copy of this diffuse grant proposal um, to DARPA proposing to do controversial viral experimentation. And in the years since that major revelation, there's been a lot of debate um, between people who favor the xenosis theory and people who favor the lab leak theory about what exactly these documents mean. The language in um, that proposal was highly technical. Um, and so there was a lot of nitpicking about whether this revelation was truly um, relevant to the origins of COVID. And I just wanted to learn more about it. Um, and it just so happened that a public institution, USGS, was a collaborator on this grant. And so I submitted a FOIA to USGS, just hoping to learn more information. Um, and it took one and a half years or so of nagging USGS to finally um, get them to turn over the documents. Um, and so we obtained them in December. Uh, I think the first major revelation um, out of those documents is that in a draft of this uh, proposal, there were comments in the margins suggesting that the work would not uh, be conducted in the U.S. under a BSL-3 um, relatively rigorous biosafety standard, but instead would be exported to Wuhan um, and be conducted under a BSL-2, which is just inadequate for airborne viruses. Um, so that was sort of the major revelation, and we wanted to get that out as soon as possible because Congress was deliberating whether to continue to allow EcoHealth Alliance to obtain um, funds from the Pentagon. Um, and then we uh, took about another month for the other um, remaining 1,200 documents, um, which were essentially minutes and drafts of the proposal that were a bit more candid about the work that they intended to do. Um, and so it, it cleared up a lot of the confusion about the more technical language in the formal proposal um, and just included more details about the the intended research. 
And you, you mentioned this, uh, the the organization that you were writing to to request these documents was USGS. What is that and what do they have to do with virology? Yeah, it's the US Geological Survey um, and their participation on the proposal had to do with immunizing bats with some of these chimeric spike proteins. Um, I, I consider that to be sort of ancillary to the core questions about the origins of COVID. Really, yeah. it was just m my way of trying to be creative and get the documents in a roundabout way, given that it's a yeah. public institution um, and given our ongoing struggles to get documents out of um, Barrick's lab at UNC. So, um, yeah. It's just yeah. uh, it's just always strange when these like seemingly random government organizations are somehow involved. I I mean I guess geological the U.S. Geological Survey bats live in caves is that like the the connection here uh, to 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 the issue at hand? I, I don't know, but uh, I do want to bring um, up this document uh, that you know th this is the proposal that uh, you're investigating. It's known as uh, Project Diffuse. Um, and uh, it's essentially a proposal to DARPA, the defense agency, uh, to collect and manipulate bat viruses ostensibly for the purpose of predicting what kind of viruses might jump from bats to humans and cause future pandemics. Uh, and you summarize one of their proposals this way, that the scientists sought to insert furin cleavage sites at the S1, S2 junction of the spike protein to assemble synthetic uh, viruses in six segments to identify coronaviruses up to 25% different from SARS and to select for receptor binding domains adept at infecting human receptors. And then you go with these bullet points and you list kind of one by one the characteristics that SARS-CoV-2, the ways in which it matches the viruses that are described in this proposal. So SARS-CoV-2 has a furin cleavage site, which we has been discussed at length and we can talk about a little bit more later. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be divided into six contiguous genomic pieces by the restriction enzymes uh, BSAL and BSMBL. Um, and orders for one of those enzymes, BSML, can be found in the documents. And the receptor binding domain appeared finely tuned for human ACE2 receptor. Uh, and then the genome has the genetic differences from SARS. Um, so here's where I want to bring in Alex to help explain the significance of their plans to assemble the viruses specifically in those six segments using some very specific enzymes. Could you explain that for us a, a little bit more deeply, Alex? Absolutely, yeah. and one kind of interesting backstory is that the Diffuse grant was proposed to the DARPA preempt call in 2018, and I had submitted or helped write in a success as well. So this oh. call is very intimately familiar to me, and um, in that context, what was distinct about Diffuse was their search for this motif that had never been seen in the SARS coronavirus before, the furin cleavage site, and their proposal to insert this thing that had never been seen before in the SARS coronavirus. And so the proposal to insert a furin cleavage site instantly puts them down a particular laboratory path. So how do you insert a furin cleavage site into a SARS coronavirus? The SARS coronavirus has this RNA genome, which you can think of as really flimsy film of a genetic strain of RNA, and it breaks very easily. It's very hard to insert motifs inside of an RNA genome. So if you want to insert a furin cleavage site, you have to build this much sturdier DNA copy of the virus. And in order to build a sturdy DNA copy of the virus, you have to build it one block at a time. We looked into the pre-COVID, well, I guess not, not we, but Valentin Brutel and Tony Van Dongen had looked, these are bioengineers, Valentin at University of Würzburg and Tony at Duke University. Um, they're bioengineers. They build these DNA blocks um, from scratch. So they looked into the methods for how people did this in coronaviruses pre-COVID and found that one of the most common methods for building these full-length DNA clones of a virus 
was to order these blocks and nip them at the end with these restriction sites that allow you to attach them one at a time until eventually you have that full length DNA clone. And one of the diffuse PIs really popularized this, this technique. Ralph Barrick wrote a paper on efficient reverse genetic systems. Well, that's a lot of words. It just means reverse genetics is you have this DNA clone that you're tinkering with to make these different RNA viruses. And in the process, experimenting with the role between these genes and the, and the manipulations of these genes, like if you're in cleavage site, on the function of the virus. Um, so that was kind of the context. We looked into this diffuse proposal and asked, okay, if they're inserting a ferrum cleavage site, they need a full-length DNA clone. If you're building a full-length DNA clone, they're probably using methodologies like those that Ralph Barrick popularized. Is there any evidence for this in the SARS-2 genome? We studied a met, we ran a meta-analysis of all these infectious clones and reverse genetic systems made before COVID and found that they all had this characteristic manner of manipulation, that researchers would look at the genome of the virus on the computer screen, look at where these cutting sites are, and they'd move them around a little bit to make it easier to assemble these blocks. And they would move these cutting sites around with these mutations called silent mutations that change the genetic sequence without changing the resulting virus. So researchers before COVID would make these full-length DNA clones by using silent mutations to move these cutting sites that form these little notches that you can use to attach chunks of DNA together to build that full length clone. We looked into that and found that SARS-2 had this very unusual pattern of evenly spaced cutting sites um, that was consistent with how people built reverse genetic systems before COVID. And that when you look closer at these cutting sites, yeah, this is the figure here, those cutting sites BSMB1 and BSA1 typically are randomly spaced throughout the genome. When you have randomly spaced things, they don't often come with fragments of this similar size. But when you look at this visually, Valentin and Tony had just screamed at them, this is unusual. And they have much, they have a lot of experience seeing what you see in the, the other, so SARS-CoV-2 is the top row here. All the other viruses, um, you know, from Banal 20, 247 to SARS-1, their BSMD1 and BSA1 sites are randomly scattered. And that's what you typically see when you upload a genome into the software that helps you see the cutting sites. Valentin and Tony uploaded SARS-2, saw this unusual pattern and thought, wow, this is like an Ikea virus. You know, this is something you could just order right from scratch and get this Allen wrench of BSMB1 and this screwdriver of BSA1 and stitch it together. So the question then was, what are the odds of this occurring in nature? And that's where I came in as a mathematical biologist to study the evolution of coronaviruses and try to get an estimate on the odds of this appearing in nature, given that it is so consistent with a reverse genetic system. We found those odds were really low. So when you, the way we estimated it was looking at this longest fragment length. So this top figure here, the y-axis is the length of the longest fragment from cutting up a virus with any one or any pair of these enzymes. And then the x-axis is the number of fragments. When Ralph Barrick wrote his paper on efficient reverse genetic systems, he proposed that red box as this idealized range for an efficient reverse genetic system, somewhere between five to eight fragments, and ideally less than 8,000 base pairs long for the longest fragment, because when you order these chunks of DNA online, um, 8,000 base pairs is a common cutoff. Now that said, the longer the fragment is, the more on the more likely it is to either contain a toxic element that prevents your ability to replicate it and clone it and, and make a lot of it. Um, and it also reduces the odds of faithful assembly. When you have a really long wiggly piece of DNA, it may not attach as faithfully or at, at high of rate um, as shorter fragments. So there's a preference to have smaller fragments in general. And that's what really was the lurking lab protocol constraints that led to this pattern of unusually even spacing in these restriction sites. So we looked at the, we quantified the odds of seeing something as or more extreme as SARS-2, just in the pattern of the spacing of these sites. And that was about a one in 1400 event. Um, so one out of 14,000, and this is actually the most extreme case of a coronavirus that we've seen for these enzymes that can be used for the assembly of these reverse genetic systems. Then we look further at the silent mutations. That's where we found hot spots like glowing genetic dust right on these specific sites. And wherever they were moved around, they were moved around exclusively with the mutations bioengineers use. And that was our most significant finding. 
And so this is what, you know, the title of your paper is uh, Endonucleus Fingerprint uh, Indicates a Synthetic Origin of SARS-CoV-2. So the fingerprint that you're referring to there is essentially the fact that there are, let me pull up that figure one more time, these rather evenly uh, spaced, like somewhat regularly length uh, segments as opposed to in a naturally occurring virus, you would get uh, much, you'd get much more variation in the length. You'd get some really short ones and some really long ones. Um, and so it's just mathematically unusual for that, or, you know, maybe even mathematically impossible or highly improbable that that would occur in nature. So would this be, um, so this would be different from, we've heard a lot of discussion about gain of function research where you would, um, one method in sort of enhancing the deadliness of a virus for humans would be to pass it through mice. So it kind of naturally, uh, you know, not naturally, but in the lab, you're kind of forcing an evolution towards deadliness. You're positing that that is not how this virus was created in, in the lab. It was more of a kind of cut and paste situation. Well, in order to conduct, there's many, so yeah, some we'll break up some terms here. The gain of function, some biologists like to kind of muddy the waters by saying, ah, well, you know, anytime you modify an organism, like add a bacillus thuringiensis toxin to corn, which helps us have the corn have this natural pesticide produced in it, they would say, ah, yeah. oh, well, that's gain of function because it gained the function that it didn't have before. So some people split hairs and say, there's a different kind of gain of function called gain of function research of concern, which is the enhancement of the transmissibility and or virulence of potentially pandemic pathogens. And this gain of function research of concern, concern started in 2011 when Ron Fouchier took an avian influenza, which was very infectious in birds and had a 50% infection fatality rate. And then he passaged it through a bunch of ferrets until he, he produced by this breeding experiment that was intended to produce a virus that was more transmissible in mammals that didn't exist in nature. So that's this gain of function research of concern. And the DARPA, the diffuse proposal, I want to give credit to DARPA. They invented the internet and they rejected diffuse. So this is a diffuse yeah. proposal of interest. You know, the diffuse proposal reveals the intentions of these researchers who previously had conducted a lot of gain of function research of concern. They would find these bat coronaviruses lurking in nature and they would swap around these parts of the bat, bat coronavirus, making these chimeras to then ask, oh, which chimera is the most infectious in people? And that question is modifying things found in nature to improve their transmissibility. And the intention, their search was for something more transmissible. So you would expect this research program to result in something more transmissible because that's what they were trying to make. And the fear and cleavage site specifically was well known before COVID that ferrin cleavage sites are found in other viruses. And when they're found in other viruses, they're kind of this master key that allow the virus to unlock all sorts of different host cells and enter into bat cells and human cells and dogs and whatever. Um, so the ferrin cleavage site was this master key. Why would you give that to a SARS coronavirus? That's anticipated to improve the transmissibility of this virus, possibly improve the virulence as well if the virus is able to infect more tissues within the human body. So that right. the insertion of the fear and cleavage site was the gain of function research of concern. And that's and just to, just to be really uh, clear for our listeners who may not have been following every detail of this, the, the fear and cleavage site, the reason that there's so much attention on it is because a um, it is th this SARS-CoV-2 is the only virus in its category the, of these SARS like coronaviruses that has it, and B, that makes it particular humans uh, particularly susceptible to it. It's, it. It eases the entry into human cells. Is that more or less the reason why the fear and cleavage site was like the, the first kind of red flag for people who thought that this might have originated in a lab? That's exactly right. A fear and cleavage site had never been observed before in a SARS coronavirus. And we when we build the evolutionary tree of a SARS coronaviruses before COVID, we had a thousand years of branches in this tree, and there wasn't a single indication that a SARS coronavirus existed anywhere in that tree. Yet they were very prominent in the minds of virologists. And this is where I can speak as you know, someone who is in that DARPA preempt community of accepted grants. 
that we all knew that the biggest crux for these jump capable quasi species, the biggest crux for host switching is binding onto the receptors of a new host. Because new hosts have very different funky receptors in their cells. So how can a virus latch onto that and enter into the cell? And the furin cleavage site assists with that process. And it was known to assist with that process. So virologists everywhere were looking for these things because they really wanted to find them. If you found a furin cleavage site in, for instance, an influenza virus that passed through a chicken farm, which they did once in one chicken farm out of all the chicken farms that had been infected with this, that was documented and there's explosive news because virologists understood the context. So the furin cleavage site was a motif, this master key that virologists knew about, but nature didn't, or nature knew about it, would stumble upon it randomly, but had not stumbled upon it in the 1000 years of SARS coronavirus evolution that we'd seen. Yet then we find the SARS coronavirus with this master key in Wuhan, exactly where researchers proposed to give it to a SARS coronavirus. So that's the fear and cleavage site. That's the gain of function research of concern component. And our work was focused more on the laboratory protocols that they had said they wanted to find all these wildlife coronaviruses. So we usually go out, you catch a bat, you sample its poop or its mouth or whatever, and then you send that into a lab and you sequence it. When you sequence it, you get this long genetic code, 30,000 base pairs on a computer. Now, how can you go from that genetic code to then saying, ah, this virus is more likely to infect people or less likely to infect people? For that, we use all these laboratory techniques to construct parts of the virus or entire viruses. And our work was focused on that, both the rescuing of viruses from a genetic sequence using these reverse genetic systems or infectious clones. And that, that's a really remarkable thing to think about is that most viruses go from a virus to cell to a virus to cell to virus to cell. And you can trace that back in time infinite, indefinitely to the origins of the virus. But infectious clones, they go from a virus to a cell, to a poop sample in a bat, to a genome on a computer screen. And then from that genome on a computer screen, we order these blocks and stitch them together. <laughs> and then mm. we make from that DNA clone, this RNA, we electrocute a cell to form these holes in it, an electroporated cell, and shove that RNA inside the cell, it starts making a virus. It's this sort of immaculate conception of modern biotechnology. And that was the most common way of rescuing coronaviruses from these wildlife samples, uh, where you could have the genome, but you may not have cultured the virus. The virus may have died while it was being transported to a lab, but you can still get the genome, you can still get the virus, you can still study it. And that methodology was also in diffuse, but it was a bit more technical and subtle to find these fingerprints in the genome, but that's what we found. So um, Alex's paper made certain predictions um, about you know, what, what uh, scientists would have done uh, to, you know, what you would expect to see in their work if this were a synthetic virus, if the, an infectious clone. What, uh, to bring it back to the documents, Emily, what do the, do how do the documents work in conjunction with Alex's work? Uh, when, when you look at them side by side, what are, what are some of the consistencies or inconsistencies that jumped out to you? Yeah. So first of all, just to follow up on some of the things that Alex mentioned. So I think, the more candid notes we have about the diffuse proposal show that their intention was to generate viruses that could generate disease in um, humanized mice. That was the so-called gold standard. That's how Peter Daszak put it in the um, meeting minutes from one of their calls together. Um, so, so the methods that they were um, using to get to that gold standard um, may have included the the technique that um, Alex described, but I think that part is somewhat controversial, whereas there are some notes that we obtained that confirm that other features of SARS-CoV-2 that immediately stood out to people as a sign of engineering in the lab were really central to the research interests of that PI he mentioned, Ralph Barrick, sort of the mm -hmm. top virologist focusing on coronaviruses in the world. Um, so he intended to create a model um, in order to generate viruses that could cause disease in humanized mice. And two of the key features that he screened for with that model or intended to screen for with that model um, were a furin cleavage site, 
you know, particularly if you're in cleavage site at the S1, S2 boundary in the spike protein and a receptor binding domain that was very good at latching on to human ACE2. Um, and th maybe that's not, um, maybe that doesn't grab people right away if you're not super familiar with the debate around the origins of COVID, but really people have been talking about SARS-CoV-2's immediate ability to um, latch on to human ACE2 from the beginning. It's a immediate ability to be very transmissible and infectious and go on to infect pretty much everyone on the globe. Um, and people have been talking about that fear and cleavage site from the beginning as a uh, signal of energy engineering. So um, I think those two elements are also very important to focus on. Um, also just, you know, as Alex mentioned, people were very interested in fear and cleavage sites around the time of the diffuse proposal when that was submitted. And in fact, in doing this reporting, I went back and I watched some of the debate around gain of function research back in 2014, um, when there was a, a pause on gain of function research of concern and uh, NIH was hosting debates about what sort of regulation should be in place. And Barrick was obviously an opponent of regulations, um, at least for coronaviruses, which was his interest. And a lot of the questions that he and his colleagues got were around, okay, so what would be a permissible experiment? Would inserting a fear and cleavage site, would that be permissible? Um, and so obviously this was on people's minds. <laughs> and so um, as someone who was not familiar with that debate and was not tracking that debate at the time. Um, it was surprising to me to go back and watch because obviously when a virus with a fear and cleavage site appeared in Wuhan, the, the lab working closely with Barrick, no one said, oh yes, we've been discussing this for years. Um, so so anyway, so, so with, uh, with regard to the restriction sites, so the documents do include a budget line for BSMBI, um, which is one of the restriction sites that make up that pattern that Alex and his colleagues described. Um, but there is some debate about, is that a budget for the entire project or is that just a budget for the USGS component? How central right. is that budget line to? Yeah, well, let me bring up, I've got a, so this is a tweet from Richard E. Bright, who uh, was one of the um, virologists who was kind of, I mean, one of the earliest people I remember raising this possibility of it being a lab leak. Um, and he calls this this invoice for this particular enzyme that Alex mm -hmm. mentions in his study this is an order form uh, for it, and he calls it the equivalent of a smoking gun. On the other hand, uh, Alina Chan, who is another, uh, someone who's been very uh, uh, um, sort of putting out the idea of that this could have been a loud leak for a long time. We've had her on the show before. She co-authored a whole book uh, about the origins of COVID with Matt Ridley called Viral. Um, and she's not convinced yet. She says there isn't enough yet to say a lab accident happened beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, mostly because the emails and documents we're talking about are from early 2018. So therefore, it's unsurprising there's not any direct evidence of, you know, a line from this, this order to the creation of SARS-CoV-2. You know, I guess an, an open question that I have for both of you is, how should we evaluate evidence and like when when is the appropriate time to say you know case closed this is you know this is the smoking gun we can pretty much say at this point we're never going to get 100 percent certainty but beyond a reasonable doubt looks like something something happened here something was constructed I'm happy to jump in here i think you know what i was doing before covid was specifically forecasting which species are quasi-species that are jump capable? What's the likelihood of that emerging? Where is it likely to emerge? Um, and what does that look like? And we all have actually seen a recent example of a natural spillover with the avian influenza outbreaks that happened last year. Many people got infected and you see these stuttering chains of transmission because exactly as Emily said, the virus was not very transmissible when it first jumped into the human population. 
And so for me, what jumped out is like, you know, we'll put the line way over here for case closed. And then there's a line way over here for open the books. <laughs> and I think mm. we crossed the open the books line immediately. When SARS-CoV-2 emerged, it had a receptor binding domain that was better at binding humans than bats. That's a really unusual feature for a bat coronavirus. Viruses specialize on their hosts. They get these very specific moldings of their spike genes, the receptors of their hosts. The receptors of bats are different from humans, so this should be molded to a bat. But instead, it looked more molded to a human than a bat. So that was immediately a very strange occurrence, that it didn't have this multiple spillover events across a wide geographic range consistent with the animal trade outbreak of SARS-1. There were not infections concentrated in animal handlers like we saw in civet handlers in SARS-1 or in poultry farmers for avian influenza. Instead, it was this singular outbreak that just exploded immediately out of Wuhan with a SARS coronavirus whose receptor binding domain was better fit for humans than bats that had a furin cleavage site that as someone, again, in this wildlife virology community, I knew that many virologists were fixated on furin cleavage sites. This was something that virologists thought a lot about. But when you look at the data in nature, nature did not stumble upon it that often. Instead, it, when it happened, we looked, made a big deal out of it, wrote big papers about it, and everyone was aware of it, but nature was not. And so for me, it was, we crossed the line to open the books almost immediately at the start of the pandemic. But there's never been, that. that's never seemed to have been the attitude. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, opening the books, uh, requ it, it would what would follow from that is, you know, op open scientific, this is a, this is an empirical question. It's so that, that requires open scientific inquiry, but I, you know, I think to kind of capture the tone of that, we can just look at these tweets from uh, Christian Anderson, who was uh, one of the authors on the famous proximal origins paper that uh, proposed that this jump from pangolins to humans, uh, that pangolins were the intermediate host. And then um, it was revealed through documents that he had these kind of this back channel with Anthony Fauci, who was sort of guiding that project the entire time. But his reaction to your uh, preprint, Alex, was that uh, it is so deeply flawed that it wouldn't pass kindergarten molecular biology. It's more of the same poppycock dressed up as science with a heavy dose of techno babble on the side. And, you know, you don't have to reply to that kind of name calling, though you can if you want. What I'd like to know is um, what are the challenges for <laughs> dissenting scientists at this point in examining the, this question? Obviously, there's been challenges along the way, but like at this point, do you feel that your paper could even get a fair peer review or, or is the process itself kind of compromised? Well, a couple of points here. One, yeah, the feedback from Christian Anderson was not the most constructive feedback we received. <laughs> um, another little aside, my mom was a molecular biologist. So in kindergarten, I was doing some, you know, listening about DNA at the table, but not that much, admittedly. Um, and then finally, you know, a lab origin involves a lab and the lab involves researchers and researchers are in this network of colleagues and funders. And so when we pass this open the books phase, very early on in the pandemic, we would have liked to hear about, for example, the diffuse proposal. But did we hear about the diffuse proposal? No, we didn't. Um, did we hear that NIAID had actually funded the unique collaboration of the diffuse PIs in 2019? No, we didn't. Instead, Anthony Fauci helped prompt that proximal origin paper. Peter Daszak, the PI of diffuse, wrote a paper to The Lancet calling lab origin theories conspiracy theories without acknowledging the conflict of interest that he was working with the lab in question, that he wrote the diffuse proposal containing a highly specific proposal to make something not found in nature, something so unnatural that you could have patented it in 2018, and SARS-CoV-2 would be an infringement of their patent. That's a very important conflict of interest he should have disclosed when we were at the open the books phase in January of 2020, and he didn't. In fact, we also have emails of Peter Daszak writing the fellow colleagues of the PI, of the fellow PIs of the Fuse proposal in an email titled, no need for you to sign the statement, Ralph, two exclamation marks. And in that email, Peter Daszak says that he they proposes that they don't sign this, that the PIs who propose to make this unique product not found in nature, which mirrors SARS-CoV-2 to the letter, um, 
They proposed to not sign this late statement calling lab origin theories conspiracy theories. DASAC was then appointed the U.S. emissary to the World Health Organization's COVID origins investigation in Wuhan, and he didn't disclose the fuse to the world then. He was appointed to lead the Lancet's COVID origin task force by Jeffrey Sachs, and he didn't disclose it then. Instead, he appointed all of his close colleagues who also had conflicts of interest in their work with the Wuhan labs as fellow investigators of this lab origin accident. When Jeffrey Sachs started turning over stones, he found conflicts of interest everywhere. And so at the heart of a lab origin is a lab and researchers. And the unfortunate thing we're seeing here is that many of the researchers and their funders have these very tight connections to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I happen to be one of the people who was working on a DARPA preempt grant in this field without any connections to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And also at the time of writing this paper, I wasn't in academia. I wasn't writing grants and IAID. I was an independent scientific consultant, and that made me somewhat immune to Christian Anderson's tweets in this sense. You know, I was really focused on the question at hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm really it's the the role of sort of institutions and people who are independent of those institutions in this is a really important and interesting aspect of how this is all played out. And I'm curious about your thoughts on it, too, Emily, because from a media perspective, you're working for an organization, U.S. Right to Know, that operates outside of the mainstream media ecosystem. It's an organization that, to be honest, I was a little wary of because I think there's some fundamental disagreements in how the editorial leadership looks at things like GMOs or the Green Revolution. But I honestly think your work speaks for itself on this topic, which is largely consists of obtaining and reporting on government documents in a pretty straightforward manner. It's odd to me that more publications haven't picked up on these documents. What do you make of the media environment at this point as it pertains to the investigation into COVID's origins? Yeah, I'm, I think before I start ranting about the media, just to follow up on a, a couple of the things that um, Alex was mentioning, I think in yeah. addition to the scientific evidence that we dug up and that he dug up, I think it's also important to look at the behavioral clues here and the odd um, actions of people sort of central to the coronavirus research going on in Wuhan after SARS-CoV-2 emerged from that city, um, including the fact that Varick was working on this model that was meant to predict whether a coronavirus could cause disease in humanized mice using, um, you know, the receptor binding domain's ability to bind to humanase 2 and fear and cleavage sites. And then when SARS-CoV-2 with this un these unique features showed up, did not raise his hand to say, I actually have a model, you know, I've been studying this yeah. for years. Um, you know, it's an here's odd my silence for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, um, and why did Dazic continue to insist for years that this work would go on at the University of North Carolina under a BSL-3 when clearly he knew, you know, he wrote this comment saying that in fact, this work would be outsourced to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and would be conducted under BSL-2. Yeah, so, let me pull that up. Uh, this is from those those documents. So uh, yeah, you you got the, the annotated comments on um, their proposal. And so here you've got, uh, um, Peter Dazak saying that, you know, if we win the contract, I am not proposing that all the work will necessarily be conducted by Ralph Barrick in North Carolina, but he wants to stress the U.S. side of the proposal to DARPA so that they're comfortable. In, in other words, he wants to play down the fact that, as he says, a lot of these this work can be done in Wuhan. Um, and then further down, you've got Ralph Barrick uh, talking about their proposal to, in China, do this in a biosecurity level two rather than the higher biosecurity level three that would be expected the U.S. And he says that, you know, um, the, if they're they're growing those in under BSL two in China, U.S. researchers will likely freak out. And so, yeah, there, there's really that it's very revealing of the 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 mindset and, and the culture of like, I mean, th these are people who have a, a really serious responsibility of handling a virus that can kill lots of people and just, just wreak 
societal destruction and they're kind of like what can we slip past DARPA? And and again, luckily DARPA did not approve this particular grant, but it does say a lot about kind of the atmosphere. Uh, what what was the the cavalier attitude of the scientists that are are working with these these really deadly, uh, da dangerous viruses? Uh, but uh, Emily, uh, continue with your your explanation of the the psychology, and then if you could also talk a little bit about the media coverage of uh, the lab leak at present. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're spot on there. I mean, Barrick said that U.S. researchers would freak out about this work being outsourced to BSL-2 in China before, uh, uh, you know, virus um, started circulating the globe um, out of Wuhan. So, um, of course, he knew people would freak out about this. Um, and instead of doing what I think would be the moral patriotic thing and being transparent um, and coming forward, uh, they attempted to save their own reputations. And clearly Dazic made a bet that these documents would never come out. And so he kept lying to his sources and um, media and lying to other scientists that this work was to be done in um, more rigorous biosafety standards of the US. And he knew that to be a lie. Um, he also said that they didn't sample in Laos. And that was also a lie. You know, some of SARS-CoV-2's closest relatives circulate in Southeast China. So that's highly relevant information to the origins of COVID. Um, and people looked in GenBank and said, it says that this this was sampled in Laos. Uh, what's going on? Um, and our documents also confirmed their intention to sample there. So um, so the behavior is very strange. The Lancet letter organizing that and telling Ralph Barrick to leave his name off. Um, it's, you know, I think that speaks volumes as well. And then also I did want to answer your original question about what is, what would constitute kind of final firm evidence. Yeah. I think the, um, the research described in the documents that we and Drastic obtained um, probably describe how SARS-CoV-2 became SARS-CoV-2, but we don't know what viruses they were starting with. We don't know at the time they were exchanging these notes and having these conversations if they had sampled SARS-CoV-2-like viruses at that point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know they uh, have identified RITG-13, one of SARS-CoV-2's closest relatives, um, but I think we need to know more information about that. But if we were to confirm that they were doing, using some of the techniques described in these documents with SARS-CoV-2 like viruses, I think that would be, I mean, as close to like a final smoking gun as you could get. Um, so, but yeah. it's also worth it also remembering. It seems very likely that, uh, let's say that the Chinese government had that information that there's almost no chance that would ever come out. Well, one quick point on that. There was an email Peter Daszak sent to his U.S.-based colleagues in April of 2020 with the subject line, China GenBank sequences. GenBank is where we deposit our sequences. And then the importance of this email was high. In that email, Peter Daszak said to his colleagues, let's not upload these China GenBank sequences. They were part of the terminated NIAID grant, that same grant that brought together diffuse collaborators in 2019. And Dasak mentioned that if you did publish these sequences, it would bring very unwelcome attention to USAID, PREDICT, UC Davis, and other colleagues on this email. So it's possible the digital signatures of this work still exist out there or have been deleted or scrubbed in a deliberate effort by Dasak to not bring unwelcome attention to he and his collaborators. Absolutely. And of course, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology took its database offline. So again, sort of the behavioral clues here um, suggest that there could be something to hide. And we've submitted uh, FOIA requests to NIH, um, which hosts the repositories for these sequences um, for metadata that could hopefully shed light on um, mm. that deleted data. Um, but yeah, so is this where I rant about the media? <laughs> well, well, let, let me let me yeah, let me bring us back to the media question for a second because you know one one example that really comes to mind for me and how that their um uh, the sort of treatment because it's not like uh the New York Times is not 
for, covered the idea of a lab leak at all or, or other uh, large prestigious organizations. It's just that there's a sort of asymmetry because I think it goes back to these this network that you're talking about. It's 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 kind of understandable. You have a respectable scientists saying one thing. They might have motives for saying that thing, but then that is what gets treated as more credible right out of the gate. And like one striking example to me was the way that this this is a New York Times article on the preprint uh, on the kind of definitive paper that's making the argument that this uh, spillover from animals to humans happened at the Hunan market. New research points to Wuhan market as pandemic origin and kind of the the way this was reported. You can see a quote from Michael Warby, one of the lead authors on it. When you look at the evidence all together. It's an extraordinarily clear picture that the pandemic started in the Hunan market. Some of those conclusions were softened a little bit once this went through peer review. Uh, notes there that it has, at the time of publication in the New York Times, it had not yet been published in a scientific journal. Um, I, I, I do want to like, you know, talk a little bit about like, the, the way that was covered, but also about the study itself. Um, maybe Alex could weigh in, in on this. Um, they're arguing that the, 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 the argument of the paper is they did samples uh, in the market. And you can see in this diagram, there's a little red hot spot where they're saying most of the virus was uh, transmitted uh, or, or, you know, the hot spot of viral samples was in this little corner, like one or two stalls. And then if you zoom in on that, you'll see they've got, you know, these two stalls kind of highlighted in red. And they've got pictures of raccoon dogs and uh, unknown birds, these uh, ma basically mammals that plausibly could have transmitted the virus from um, uh, two human beings in the market and, and kicked this pandemic off. What uh, th th this is st the this and one other paper who was was by uh, many of the same authors are kind of like the touchstones for like th this is the definitive argument for zoonotic spillover of the virus, which which is which is a very common way for pandemics to start. What is your analysis uh, in short of of this paper, Alex? I, if you could keep up that figure, that's actually a great great touch point. Um, so this analysis made a statistical error, and the error fails to account for sampling biases. Um, if you look at that little gradation of number of environmental positives at the middle, kind of near the bottom there, that's mm -hmm. the statistic that they were analyzing. And so, yeah, it looks like there's a high number of environmental positives in this um, lower left quadrant. However, we, we pointed out that the Chinese researchers who conducted this work said in their methods, they are prioritizing samples near animal stalls. So they took more samples. That's why there's a higher number of samples. If you look at the percent of samples that test positive, they were actually highest near vegetable traders and in the toilet, <laughs> in the sewage. So it tells a very different epidemiological story of human to human transmission. And another point to, you know, on the broader um, topic of Warby et al, they looked at where are cases found within the city of Wuhan. And they said, ah, oh, well, these cases found within the city of Wuhan with asterisk cases provided by the Chinese government were centralized, localized around the Wuhan, uh, the Hunan seafood market. However, when you do a statistical analysis of those data, you find that the unlinked cases um, are actually closer to the seafood market, which suggests that these cases did have this bias in case ascertainment. Furthermore, there were cases left out of this analysis, cases that preceded the wet market outbreak. For instance, a December 4th report of a SARS coronavirus case in Wuhan that coincided with an uptick of the use of the word SARS in the Chinese social media app Weibo. So that, those two data points corroborate this case preceding the wet market outbreak. And furthermore, there's another analysis of these care-seeking terms that are less likely to have been filtered, which show that the earlier hotspot of care-seeking term usage in Wuhan was on the other side of the river near a hospital that's one of the closest hospitals to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So when we try to look at these independent lines to corroborate this, and when we account for the statistical biases, their findings don't hold. Their claim of dispositive evidence hasn't lasted the test of time. 
So that's the war Vietnam paper. And most of us who are in the field knew that right away. David Roman called this hopelessly impoverished early case data. Um, and it was quite evident that that was the case. So for us scientists in the field, it's unusual that these two papers, the other one had similar statistical flaws and a bug in its code that completely undermined it. These two papers were both published side by side in science and then both presented in the New York Times and the Atlantic and the Guardian as you know, dispositive evidence that's been solved. And for many of us scientists, especially me, familiar with the standards of evidence in the field before COVID, for instance, looking at the percent of PCR tests that are positive, which we all know was a big debate during COVID in terms of how to measure prevalence in the population um, to control for increasing rates of testing. You know, for us who are familiar with the standards of evidence and the common modes of analysis in the field, these papers were highly unusual. So was the proximal origin paper by these same authors. And then you trace it back to the wall and you find that Anthony Fauci, who funded the diffuse PIs in 2019, he prompted this call. He put the people in the room. And who did he put in the room with Christian Anderson and Eddie Holmes? He put in the leading proponents of gain-of-function research, including the OG, Ron Fouchier, who passaged that avian influenza through ferrets. So this was, you know, it's like the EPA calling in all the oil and gas companies when they're presented with a study finding evidence of climate change. You know, when us scientists who are familiar with the other scientists and the debates in the field and the methods and modes of analysis, when we see this, it's just, a, it, that to me is raising alarm bells in addition to the genomic evidence of the fear and cleavage site, not just any fear and cleavage site, you know, but a fear and cleavage site in the exact position where Emily's recently FOIA documents proposed to insert it um, in Wuhan, where this was proposed to be conducted and far from the hotspot of bat SARS coronaviruses and a litany of other evidence that all combines. And I think for me, that's how I think of the evidence is we have to treat these zoonotic origin papers methodically and look at them carefully and see how much evidence they do provide once we throw those off the table based on their statistical flaws and other other problems with them, all that's left is this mountain of evidence. You know, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. We're looking for that straw, but we're forgetting about the many bales of hay that are already there. And that's, you know, our paper was yet another straw. But Emily is right to point out and thinking about this evidence, you have to look at everything. You have to look at the Wuhan origin, the furin cleavage site at the S1-S2 junction with these weird codons bioengineers use with all this weird behavior, both of the Chinese government and the researchers connected with the Wuhan labs. And coincidentally, we found evidence consistent with the exact method for assembly that they proposed. And that every time we FOIA new documents, we only get closer to the truth that corroborates this theory we've had all along. So what does this all say about the state of science journalism, uh, Emily? Emily, do you want to take that? I've got opinions, but I feel like you have some good ones too. Yeah, um, I feel like I could rant about this all day, but I think just taking the war B paper as an example, um, I mean, some of this stuff we're discussing is very high level and maybe the journalists just didn't understand, you might say. But remember that at the point that that preprint came out and the New York Times push alerted it, the senior authors of that paper had been caught lying already. We already had the FOIA emails showing that Anderson said that the SARS-CoV-2 genome had features consistent with engineering, and then four days later told the National Academies that um, that, that was a crank theory. Um, and we already knew that Robert Gary, another author on that paper, um, had said, I can't figure out how this spike protein gets accomplished in nature, but it would be easy to do in a lab. And then, you know, a few days later started drafting a paper that would dismiss the idea of engineering as a conspiracy theory. So these people were already not credible, you know, and Zach, you were talking about how, you know, people's default is often, well, this person has a lot of expertise, they're affiliated with this prestigious institution, they seem the, the most credible. And um, in 99% of cases, I would agree. <laughs> but I think we're in this unique situation where we're trusting virologists to give us straight answer straight answers about whether a pandemic that killed millions of people stemmed from controversial virology research um and you know these virologists in particular already at this point had a track record of dishonesty um and i think when you're a reporter i think you have to have 
some healthy skepticism and, you know, prestige is important. Expertise is important, but so is integrity. And I remember when this, you know, paper got a lot of attention in the press. I mean, the New York Times alerted it, CNN alerted it, a bunch of other news organizations. I remember thinking, you know, does honesty not matter? Does integrity not matter? Um, I think it clearly matters. And, um, you know, another aspect here um, that should have alerted journalists to something strange going on was the fact that, I mean, literally hours before the Warby preprint published, the China CDC had come out with its own analysis um, in a preprint of this data. And they had concluded that the wet market was a super spreader event, that it had just amplified an already existing epidemic. Um, you know, that conclusion happens to um, be consistent with their country's propaganda around the pandemic starting somewhere else, but they did collect the data um, and they have more knowledge about how they collected their own data than Western scientists working on laptops many miles away. And what they said was exactly what Alex just said, which is that, you know, these samples that appear to cluster around the animal stalls, we actually focused our, our collection efforts there. Um, and Jesse Bloom has analyzed the metagenomic data and found that um, animal DNA, specifically animals that could have served as intermediate hosts like raccoon dogs, um, is uh, not correlated with SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and so those samples are not very meaningful, which China CDC knew and said <laughs> right before um, the New York Times put on its front page that it was definitely the wet market and the lab leak theory is a conspiracy theory. Um, and I think the more information we've gotten, um, the less and less these papers have stood up. Recently, two experts in spatial statistics put out a paper basically saying that the war B paper is extremely flawed. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of follow up that I've seen in the Western media, at least, to correct the record and to also look at some of the evidence that's accumulated on the lab side. So um, there's a lack of like follow up also. You know, uh, Alex, when Emily talks about integrity that is it's just so striking to go back to that docu the annotated document where you've got um uh, you've got uh peter dajak saying we're going to just downplay or you know conceal the fact that most of this very risky research is going to be taking place in china um the 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 attitude that's on display that we talked about a little bit earlier do you have any thoughts about what can be done to change the culture or the mindset that is on display there as someone who has worked in this world of pursuing government contracts uh, or, you know, DARPA grants uh, in virology? Well, I think one, give credit to DARPA where it's due, that they rejected this proposal, that they saw through right. this unsafe research proposed by DASAC, and they said no. Um, but then you have to look at NIAID that funded these diffuse collaborators in 2019. And then you actually have to look back beyond that to Ron Fouchier. And you have to look at, you know, the history of this uh, pandemic started in 2011. Um, most people are looking at, you know, the wet market in January 2020 or cases in late 2019. But this started in 2011. And that was the beginning of a systemic seismic shift in this research community where many researchers were outraged that Ron Fouchier not only did this research that risked causing a pandemic and killing millions of people, but if it was really bad, it could end human civilization. And scientists spoke up within our community and we said, this is not okay. Um, please stop, please halt this risk research. It's not worth the risk. We're not getting any material benefits. There's no treatments or vaccines coming from this work. Stop it. Um, but why didn't we stop it? And that goes back to these 2014 discussions that Emily's been listening to and others as well, where there was this massive debate. There was this Cambridge working group of scientists from Harvard and elsewhere that were saying, and Richard E. Bright and David Roman saying, we need to stop this. The risk, the benefit um, does not outweigh the risks of this work. And then there was a very political group 
called Scientists for Science. Effectively, the boys will be boys of science that said, hey, just let us do science. We need to be able to do this work because you never know what benefits might lurk around the corner, but we know the risks lurk around the corner and they are catastrophic. And so the Scientists for Science, who signed that? Who were those people? If you look down that list, you'll see a lot of familiar names. You'll see Ron Fouchier and Christian Drosten, who were um, the, two of the people that Fauci, Farrar, and Collins invited into the room in February of 2020. You'll see Vincent Rockandiello, the host of This Week in Virology, whose student Angela Rasmussen has become this very outspoken proponent of let scientists do science, let boys be boys. You'll see seven signatories who are members of NIH and NIAID, including David Morenz, who Peter Daszak described as a mentor. And David Morenz was now shown to have been withholding or to have been failing to comply with federal records uh, retention requirements by using his Gmail account to conduct official NIH business. He's since been removed from his post at NIH, but yet we still don't have his Gmail communications with his mentee, Peter Daszak, who he was yeah. in communication with in 2019. So we have this very systemic shift in science where NIAID led by Anthony Fauci, sided with scientists for science in this debate between scientists. So we had this kingmaker of Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins who saw this debate in science and said, we're going to work with these people. <laughs> and in fact, their own people, David Morenz and others at NIAID, sided with the you know, proponents of this risky work. So even though there was a moratorium in 2014 that Obama helped pass in 2017, Fauci and, and Collins redefine the law, they said, well, it's not gain of function research of concern if you're doing gain of function research of concern to make vaccines, which is like saying it's not nuclear weapons development if you develop nuclear weapons to test bunkers, when obviously that would be very unethical and morally repulsive to anyone in the public who heard that reasoning. And that, again, 2017, in that time range, Peter Daszak thanked NIAID for overturning his own moratorium and pause on, on his gain of function funding pause on his work in this NIAID grant that in 2020, he says he found these China Gen Bank sequences that we should not publish. And so you have to trace it back. You know, there are these systemic mm -hmm. problems in science and they relate to this inequality of power that comes from science funders being able to choose the winners of science. And, you know, there, that, that's been a very difficult thing to overturn. And Anthony Fauci, being the head of NIAID for 30 years, has so many connections in the media. And he has so many connections at Science, the magazine, to help science journalists tell the story he wishes to tell. So when you see Proximal Origin written, and then days later, Anthony Fauci using his bully pulpit as the head of NIAID, talking to international news outlets saying, oh, there's this paper. I don't know who wrote it. You know, I don't know the authors, but it shows conclusively this did not come from a lab without disclosing that, again, his agency supported this research, overturned the moratorium and funded these exact collaborators in 2019. What we're seeing is this very systemic problem. It's, you know, we would like to localize it. You know, I don't want to localize it too much because this isn't the fault of a grad student that took yeah. over a vial or was bitten by a mouse. You know, this goes higher than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that that idea of, you know, either decentralizing science funding or building some more firewalls between the people in political power and the people uh, giving out the grants is something we've talked about on this show before in terms of other COVID policy, in terms of basically COVID policy that was questioned uh, throughout the pandemic. And I, I think it's, uh, I hope it's something that someone in Congress, you know, picks up and, and runs with. Um, in terms of, you know, what needs to be uncovered at this point, what what more information needs to be pried out of people's hands or email inboxes by journalists or congressional investigators, you know, I, I'm really haunted by this theory that Rand Paul laid out when I spoke to him late last year. He's someone who's uh, continued to press on this issue. I want to play a clip of what Senator Senator Paul thinks is the best theory as to where this all started based on the intelligence that he's reviewed, and then get your reactions to that as we start to bring this to a close. Let's roll that Rand Paul clip. Your best theory is, is that the Chinese created a virus, COVID, in order to try to create a vaccine to oppose it, to try to see if they could create a vaccine that would work for all coronaviruses. 
Hmm. The person who was uh, working on these vaccines, we know his name, a General Zoe Yusin, and he's developing this vaccine sometime in 2019, but he has to have somebody develop a mutant coronavirus that actually infects humans well. We think that's what COVID was, was developed in the lab to create the vaccine. We also know that Zoe Yusin got a vaccine and he has it created by February of 2020. And most people think there's no way he could have gotten it that quickly unless he'd been working on it for some time. We also know that this general dies mysteriously two months later. So there's a lot to be said here that what was going on is a creation of a virus, creating a gain of function coronavirus that would infect humans easily, and then uh, creating a vaccine from that. And what happened is that uh, it accidentally got out of the lab. Okay, so what Rand Paul is referencing is this general in China's People's Liberation Army, the PLA, Zhou Yusin. Um, and according to the House Minority Select Committee on Intelligence report uh, on the origins of COVID, uh, hold on, I had it here. Oh, yeah, they said that a sign, so that General Zhou had reportedly worked with the WIV, with the Wuhan Institute for Virology for years before the pandemic. General Zhu had worked extensively on coronavirus research coronavirus research for several years. And on February 20th, February 24th, 2020, a team led by General Zhu filed a patent application for a COVID-19 vaccine, which the authors here characterize as an improbably fast timeline. Notably in the spring of 2020, as global COVID-19 cases surpassed 7 million and COVID-19 deaths surpassed 400,000, General Zhou reportedly died under mysterious circumstances. You know, the, and just to uh, bracket that for a second, uh, you know, we don't, we have limited information uh, about what goes on in China. We're relying on, you know, reports from uh, intelligence agents who are getting reports from people on the ground and their, you know, their take, their analysis is that he may have fallen off the roof of one of these labs. Um, but anyway, in light of the information above, they continue, it's plausible to hypothesize that General Zhou's team of researchers already possessed uh, SARS-CoV-2 prior to the pandemic as part of bioweapons research and was working on vaccine-related experiments involving the virus in 2019 and that a safety incident at the uh, Institute led to its release into the world. So the hypothesis is that basically they're trying to create like almost a, a universal COVID uh, or um, coronavirus vaccine. And this was like the, the virus they created to test against that. Um, you know, do you have any, obviously none of us have any special insight about what went on in China. Um, but what really concerned me about all of it is the overlap between military operations and science throughout this whole story, really, whether it's the PLA in China or DARPA in the US. Um, what have you found pulling on those kinds of threads, Emily? So my recollection is that General Zhao, um, his death was not announced in the way you would expect from a scientist uh, of his prestige. Um, whether or not he was pushed out of a window of the WIV, um, I don't know. I'd love to see that intelligence. Um, and whether or not that abbreviated vaccine development timeline is a red flag, um, I don't feel qualified enough to um assess that. I think there are um, conflicting opinions um, and some debate about that. Because I, I guess the counter argument would be, I believe Moderna developed their vaccine extremely fast, maybe even as early as January. So that that's like the nature of mRNA technology. So that is a possibility. Right, right. right. Um, I do know through our reporting, we obtained last year uh, three mm. State Department cables um, or two, excuse me, two State Department cables that um, detail involvement of the PLA at the WIV. Um, this is something that Xi Jinping Li was not honest about. Um, so that's unusual. Um, but unfortunately, those cables were heavily redacted. Um, you know, the ODNI did put out a very brief 
um, summary of intelligence related to the WIV that confirmed uh, military involvement with the research there, including research on coronaviruses, um, but didn't include a lot of detail um, about the nature of that research. So I think we need more information and both chambers of commerce or both chambers of um, Congress uh, unanimously approved a bill saying that we need to declassify intelligence related to the WIV. And so I think we deserve to know um, more information about that. But I don't I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like anytime you get into national security, there's these major transparency issues. Um, and mm -hmm. as I was going through the documents that you posted, um, I took a little screen recording of just this series of redacted pages um, in the documents. Um, and uh, maybe we can have Hunt uh, roll those for a second while we continue to talk. This is just a continuous like stream of redacted pages. So at some point, classification, it just becomes a brick wall and you have to either rely on whistleblowers or a really motivated investigator within the government. So, so you know, as we close out, I'd like to hear from each of you what is the next step you'd like to see here, either in terms of some specific piece of information coming forward, policy action being taken, or even just a cultural change within journalism or science. Um, let's go to Alex first and then uh, give Emily the last word. I think you asked the big question, Zach. Um, I don't have a little answer for it. Um, science, we scientists need to be able to construct better systems to hold each other accountable. We need to yeah, the, the, the concepts of decentralizing science funding are useful for the, the ability to just remove these kingpins from this from the field but there's still going to be the questions about the research ethics and risk taking in science and when ron fouchier published this work in science um, and when people publish similar work in nature and science and cell um, there was this incentive for scientists to take greater risks and I think scientists need to evaluate our own system of publication and merit allocation and funding to really think carefully about Pandora's box. We haven't because we haven't opened Pandora's box quite like this before. And so I think there's going to be some ma major social and systemic issues. I think scientists really need to speak up and be independent um, so that we can start to restore trust in our community and also help our community stay away from these, you know, extremely risky experiments. And really, I mean, after the Holocaust or after, you know, the World War II, Germany had a very serious national reckoning and has embedded into its culture, teaching kids about how they went wrong. And I think scientists need to be focused explicitly on that, on how we went wrong from Ron Fouchier to Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins to Peter Daszak and more. Um, and then I think from the journalist side of things, there's a lot of structural issues facing journalism. I just want to say that it's amazing to see what Emily has been able to do in this. And I think this is inspiring to me that there are this, there is this vast network of people out there with, you know, with sharp minds and, you know, stubborn heads that are you know, <laughs> pushing for this information. I think the key pieces of information we need to hear from are those China Gen Bank sequences, DASAC withheld. I think we need to hear communications from David Morens and other program officers and NIH and IID. Emily herself and the U.S. Right to Know team already have FOIA standing for UNC's Ralph Barrick, who is also part of this collaboration. We need to be able to pry open these books, look at it. And personally, I'm not in a very retributive mindset, but I just think for the purpose of safeguarding the world in the future, we have to have a full account while everyone is alive today you know, before someone falls from a roof or something like that, we need to be able to have an account where people tell us what they did and why they did it so that we can actually create this social system in science to prevent that from ever happening again. Emily? I don't know that I am hoping for any specific policy outcome um, or a change in the press. I just honestly want there to be clarity and a national reckoning for everyone who lost loved ones to the pandemic um, or who lost businesses or major milestones in their life. Um, I, I honestly think this will probably be my last investigation and I've kind of been approaching it that way. I don't have a lot of hope that 
you know, journalism will tomorrow be like, actually, this is very valuable reporting um, and we should reward it. I think um, I just want there to be clarity and some closure for people who are grieving. That's really my my one hope. So. Oh, well, that that's kind of surprising and and disappointing. What? Why is this? Why are you thinking this is your last investigation? Are you just like there's your you've hit a brick wall? I don't know that I will be employable after this. <laughs> so, at least in the media wow. as it exists now. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I don't. I guess think a lot about like this is how I want the press to change. You know, I. Mm -hmm. I just want there to be clarity around this kind of most um, monumental thing that has happened um, in modern times. Mm -hmm. So that's really my hope. Oh. I, mean, yeah. I can well, echo Emily's we... sentiment that the challenge of speaking truth to power is power. And as a scientist trying to speak this truth, it's also affected my career um, and alienated me from colleagues. And so this is the kind of social system that we exist in from journalism to science and that's something we need to reevaluate and reconstruct. Yeah, to totally agreed. Because uh, if you two are being marginalized to that extent, where uh, you're, you know, you're feeling like you're not even employable uh, within these institutions going forward, there's something seriously wrong here. And uh, hopefully, um, there's, you know, some sort of uh, turnaround here, or some some hope on the horizon. Um, and uh, that information <laughs> continues to come out and, and correct uh, what has clearly been uh, just a series of cover-ups and uh, uh, hubris and uh, errors. Uh, and I just want to thank both of you for, you know, joining me today to walk us through it um, and uh, hope that you you are able to continue your work in, in some form. Emily Cup, Alex Washburn, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you, Zach. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and Facebook page every Thursday and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Friday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.